Thank you. How we doing? Good. Been a good service so far. Yeah, there we go. I got some witnesses. Man, I don't know who that gal was that gave the charge today, but I'd like to meet her. <laughs> that was good. Amen. Well, it's a privilege and an honor today to be able to share God's word with you. I just love those opportunities that the Lord gives us to stretch us. Our Christian walk is not to be a plateaued walk. It's to be a stretching walk. He always wants to take us higher, further, and deeper. He's always looking out for our good and ways to grow us. Sometimes it may be a little uncomfortable, but you know what? He's always looking out for our good. That's our God. His goodness, like we sang, it's running after us. And if we would learn to partner with it, knowing that it's all about your growth, your maturity, your progress on this journey through life. Wow, I'm, I'm coming off pretty strong here, ain't I? Better lower the mic a little bit. But, amen. Let's pray for Jason and Shelley. Jason's a little under the weather here. Lord, we send forth your word, which heals, Lord. And we speak through the authority that we, you have given us. And we tell his body to rise up in the name of Jesus. And for this sickness to bow down in the name of Jesus. So, Lord, we speak health, prosperity. And, Father, we just pray strength in that household, Father. And, Lord, we agree together today as touching these things. Lord, you've given us this power and this authority to do this. And we partner with you in Jesus' name for the good results. Amen and amen. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. Well, um, thanks to everybody today for allowing this service to be going so smooth, even when Jason and Shelley's not here, and I believe that's the way they want it to go. Just so if something ever happens to them, it could just continue to go on for as long as the Lord tarries. And my boss used to talk about that at work. He always wanted us to be qualified on everything to where if something ever happened to him, that business would be conducted as usual and there would be a seamless transition. So thank you to everybody who's put forth extra effort this morning. I have... I've got a subject today I want to talk to you about. It affects all of us. I want to talk to you today about eternity. It's a really good subject. It's a really long, long, long subject. No pun intended. But I don't know how much thought we give a lot of times to eternity. But it's going to be something that we all face someday. And looking around here, I think a lot of us has already got our affairs in order. So if that day comes, we're ready to meet it. But I want to talk to you today about things that are going to go on in eternity that affect you all of that time. But the things that we do here really going to determine how that goes. But first of all, <clears throat> I like to do this before I get ready to teach or anything like this. I want you to hold your arms out or your hands out because the word says that with meekness, we want to receive the engrafted word, which is able to save our souls. So I pray that today over your people, God that they would receive your word, which is able to transform them, which is able to change them and convert them into the more of an image of your son. And God, I pray that it falls upon good soil today and it produces a healthy crop for eternity, Lord. And I speak that in the name of Jesus today. Amen and amen. <clears throat> 
I got a lot of info. I thought I was going to have to break this into two parts, but I think I <clears throat> trimmed it down enough to where I can get it in today. So <clears throat> I need you today to put on your imagination hats there because I'm going to kind of paint a picture here, give it a little bit of an analogy of eternity. It's kind of a crude analogy, but I'm going to do my best here. But first, I want to share some scriptures right off the bat. Eternity is a subject that some people on the world, they, they just think that once you die, it's all over with, and there's nothing beyond that. Uh, just a few scriptures here. Matthew 25, 46, if you're taking notes, Jesus is talking about the sheep and the goats. He's separating them out. One of them gets on one side, one of them gets on the other side. And some of them go to eternal punishment, and then the righteous go to eternal life. Uh, John 3.36 talks about believing in the Son, and if you do that, you have eternal life. But to reject Him, there's no life at all. John 5, 24 says, anybody that hears my words and believes <clears throat> has eternal life. Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. I could go on and on and on and on. There are so many scriptures about eternity. <clears throat> it's a fact that eternity is waiting for all of us. The moment we close our eyes, we're going to step into that. And it's not a popular subject we like to talk about. We all know we have this appointment one day when we're going to close our eyes here and open them there. Especially in the world, they get a little nervous when you talk about that because it confronts them with the reality of what we've all got to face. I want to try to paint a picture here real quick. I want you to imagine this. <clears throat> I want you to imagine up here there's a map of the United States. On one end, you have California. And on the other end, you have Maine. And if you drew a straight line between there, and if you calculated the mileage on that, that would be roughly 3,200 miles. If you stretched out a tape measure, this is where it gets real fun for you mathematicians. If you stretched out a tape measure, if you measured that in inches, that would be 205,553,600 inches. That's a long way. Now let's think about this for a minute. I'm trying to get you to, to see a picture of eternity here. Let's just say we, were, we had to walk this. And each inch that we went is our lifetime. Take 205 million years to do that. Then if some by chance you could comprehend that and actually make the journey you'd have to turn around and do it all over again. And then if you got to that end, you'd have to turn around and do it all over again. It just keeps going on and on and on and on and on. That is just a small picture of what eternity is. If you could somehow fathom walking that and each lifetime is an inch, that's a lot of years. <clears throat> it's almost unfathomable. What I want to tell you today is this. <clears throat> There's a link between eternity and now. And what you believe today and what you do today is going to affect that. Let's consider some stuff here. Let's consider discovering this connection between your life now and your life in eternity and what it can mean to you. If your actions today could possibly have the chance to radically change your eternity, would that not be worth looking at? 
if it could drastically change that which you do in eternity, how would you live each and every moment? How would you view God? What would you choose from minute to minute? I'm going to try to help you with that today because I can testify, and I don't have time to give testimonies, but I can testify that principles that I'm going to share with you today that Carlene and I have learned a long time ago and started walking in has radically changed our life. Carlene and I are just simple country folk from Hendricks County. We grew up in just farm towns. We don't have any special gifts, abilities, talents, multiple degrees, etc. Nothing like that. But yet, applying principles that I'm going to talk to you today, a long time ago in the kingdom, it revolutionized our walk with the Lord. It has blessed our marriage. It has blessed our work. The Lord has opened so many doors that we didn't think would be possible. It has blessed our finances. It has blessed the way we comprehend and learn scriptures. All from these things that I'm going to share with you today. And I want to remind you that there is that day coming up. And what do I mean by that day? Well, if you got your Bibles, let's turn over there to Romans 14. Specifically, the second half of that scripture. 14.10. It says, remember this, everybody, that we are all going to stand before the judgment seat of God. That's the day I'm talking about. Skipping down a few verses in chapter 14, verse 12, it says, Yes, each one of us is going to give an a personal account to the Lord. I got to tell you right now, everything you do, you think, how you react, act here on planet Earth... There is a CPA in the sky that's taking an account of everything. And it's a good thing, especially on this side of salvation, because everything you do here is rewarded. This is a good story. So this is what I really want to focus on today. This is nothing to be fearful about. Jesus already took your punishment he, put, he took it on his body, and if you ask the Lord into your life, he has paid that price for you. He's taken the judgment that a lot of people are unfortunately going to face that you have willingly accepted. Another scripture I want to talk about is in 2 Corinthians 5.10. It says there that we must all stand before Christ to be judged. And we will receive whatever we deserve for good or evil that we have done in this body. Another translation talks about the Bema seat. The Bema seat is the seat of judgment that Paul sat in in Corinth. It's a judgment of rewards for the Christian. How many of you guys know that we are stewards of everything that God has given us? In some ways, we're employed by the kingdom of heaven. I know that sounds kind of strange, but when you say yes to Jesus, you transfer kingdoms. You're pulled out of the kingdom of darkness and you're planted into the kingdom of his dear son. And there are rules in this kingdom like there are in any other thing that we do in life. When I was in the military, I had to raise my hand and 
they owned me for four years. I mean, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, no matter what was going on in this world, I was on call. I was on duty and I was being paid around the clock. Each one of us, when we say yes to Jesus, we're brought into this kingdom. We're on the clock. So you might say if you work full time right now, you've got two full time jobs. If you work full time and you got a part time job, you got two full time jobs and a part time job. And I know this is tough. I mean, especially when you're managing raising kids, activities outside of here, church activities, family. You know, there's only so many hours in the day and you got to sleep sometime. But God is so good. There's a, there's a scripture here in Matthew 25 that I'm going to get to. But here I want to read this first to bring this in perspective. And when I was discharged from the military, I want to add to this, I still... I'm in the military. I still receive benefits from the military. So it's still ongoing. That, that life that I had there will never stop until I die. But each and every one of us has been commissioned to manage an asset for our master. This is each and every one of us. The asset is our life. The sum of all my talents, my strengths, my personalities, my personality, and my interest. My opportunity is to manage my life in such a way that I greatly increase my master's kingdom. That's our commission. Our master has not yet returned. Remember, Jesus said, I went to prepare a place for you. I'm going to leave you in charge. I'm blessing you with all the gifts that I had. And you're even going to do greater works than I did. Every day I should ask this question. How will I steward what my master has placed in my care? Each and every one of us has gifts, talents, time, treasure that we're responsible for managing. In fact, every day we're answering these questions based upon what we do. We need to act intentionally. And there's a Hebrew word for that. It's called kavanah. It's specifically designed for prayer, but it also involves every other aspect in our life. Kavanah means to be intentional. It means to be zeroed in and focused on your mission. Hebrew words and Greek words, they really have a lot of expounding on it. That's why we did the Lagos and Lexicon to, to help broaden what the English is not telling us. English is just a really simple language, but Kavanaugh means really to get down to the heart of the matter. It means uh, it's a worshiper's state of heart and mind. It's sincerity and devotion. And our commission we are to act intentionally, Kavanaugh, on our commission. We are deciding by our actions and our attitudes how we steward the opportunities God gives us every single day. And what my goal is today is I hope to broaden every action that you do. Wherever you're at, no matter where you're at, no matter what you're doing, whether it's in the private prayer time in your closet whether it's at the gas pump, whether it's in Kroger, whether it's being it with your family, that there is opportunity there to steward what the Lord has given us. And I want everybody to turn over there to Matthew 25 with me. There's a story here that I want to drill down on here a little bit. Twenty-five, fourteen. 
It's about a parable about talents. And this is specifically about money talents. It says here, again, there was a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted them with his property. And to one he gave five talents of money, to another two, and to another one, each according to his ability. So that means there's a variation in what is given to everybody. Then he went on a journey. And we know our Lord has went on a journey and he's entrusted us with these things. The man who had received five talents went at once and put his money to work and gained five more. So also the one with two talents, he went and gained two more. But the man who had received one talent went off. He dug a hole and he hid it from his master. And after a long time, and this is where we're at right now, folks. This is the long time. This is what we're waiting for, the return of our Lord. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled the accounts with them. The man who had received five talents brought the other five to the master and said, See, look what I have gained. The master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things, and I will make you in charge of many. Come and share in your master's happiness. The man with two talents also came. Master, he said, You've entrusted me with two. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will get, make you, put you in charge of many. Come and share in my master's happiness. Then the man who had received the one talent came, and he said, Master, I knew you were a hard man harvesting where you had not sown and gathering where you were not scattering seed. So I was afraid. That's a flag right there. And went out and hid your talent in the ground. So here is what belongs to you. The master replied pretty harshly here, you wicked and lazy servant. So you knew that I harvested where I had not sown and gathered where I had not scattered. Well then, you should have at least, at least have put my money in the bank and made interest on it. And he took the talent from him and gave it to the one who has ten. For everyone who has will be given more and will have an abundance Whoever does not have, from him it will be taken and it will be thrown into outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is a parable about us. You see, it's in God's nature to bless. That's, that's who he is. He loves to bless. He loves to lavish on you. He loves to pour out on you. And he does that in response to the rewards and the works that you do and your faithfulness. Our nature is to simply receive the blessings that he gives us. That's all we're supposed to do. Do the work that he asked us to do and receive the blessing that he's poured out upon us. Carlene and I entered into that years ago when we heard this. We started getting involved in the church. We started going on short-term mission trips. We started giving of our time, our treasure, and our talents and every opportunity that we could just to grow, to be part of this body. And the Lord kept 
blessing us back with more and more and more, with more favor, with more blessings, with more wisdom, with good health. Things in our household really hardly ever seem to break down. We just found a principle in Scripture that we applied to our life. And it's a basic principle in the kingdom. Sowing and reaping. We invested in the kingdom and we reap the goodness from the kingdom. The Scripture tells us that the parable of the seed and the sower, if you don't understand and apply just that first parable there, it says none of the other parables you'll even understand. So that's truly entry level in the kingdom. Again, it's in the heart of our Father to bless us. It's our nature to receive the thanksgiving and the rewards. Which leads me into my next section here. I want to talk about rewards for a second. And the whole reason why that I started talking about eternity here. Every single action that we do, everything that we accomplish for the kingdom, all the blessings, all the prayers that we lift up, all the tears that we cry, all the hardships that we push through, all the sacrifices that we are making. Our Heavenly Father is taking all of these things into account. Now, he doesn't have to reward us, but that's just who He is. How many of you like to reward your children? Has anybody ever been to an award ceremony or have received an award yourself? How many of you got a credit card and you get cash back? Woo, you know, I like rewards. Rewards are a good thing. It's better than punishment. But that's who our Father is. He's a God who loves to reward. And as we enter into this kingdom that we're involved in here, there's certain mechanisms that trigger these things, like giving and, and receiving. There are some kind of unorthodox things in, in the kingdom. You literally have to die to live. You have to give to get. You have to humble yourself to be exalted. A lot of these things, the world's like, it doesn't, it doesn't figure up. It doesn't calculate. But, you know, God's ways are certainly a lot higher than ours. Let's talk about some rewards here. Let's turn over there to Matthew chapter 19. Jesus is having a conversation with a rich man. And it's kind of going like this. Master, what should I do to have eternal life? Well, obey the commandments. And he just kind of listed a few things out to Jesus. Or Jesus listed some things out. And the guy says, I've done all of these things. And he, and he looked at him and said, ah, okay. Give all you have away, and then you'll have treasure in heaven that'll last for eternity, and come follow me. I want to hone in on treasure in heaven. Everything that you do, you're storing up treasure. How many of you here got a checking account or a savings account? Just a few of you? Hopefully you all do. How many like got a 401k or something like that too, or a pension? Of course. You're storing up for a rainy day. You're storing up for that day that uh, you walk away from your job and whatever the next chapter of your life is that the Lord's going to lead you into. Same way with every work that we do here on earth, there's a deposit made in heaven. There's a reason why we tell you around here, make deposits in your heavenly account. Because what we do in this little tiny portion of life 
Think about that eternity scale that I talked about earlier. It's minute. It's like a grain of sand on all the beaches of the world. Your, your life is like that grain of sand compared to all of them. It's just what we're doing here in this life is going to really impact what goes on in eternity. And I want to say this, that the Bible doesn't exactly say what all we're going to be doing there. But I can tell you this, you're not going to get your harp and your wings and you're going to, not going to get a cloud to lay on for eternity. It just doesn't work that way. There are scriptures in Revelation that talk about servitude in heaven. And if I can just think about my heavenly father and knowing how creative he is, I think his nature is to work. The universe is extremely vast, and I don't even think we have scratched the surface on what, how big it is. Who knows? Maybe we'll be going to other worlds. I don't know. I just know that there's going to be things to do there. Our God is one of those gods who loves to be creative. Another scripture is in um, Mark chapter 9, verse 41. The Lord cares so much about what you do that something even as simple as giving a cup of cold water in his name, there's a reward attached to that. In the Beatitudes there in Luke 6, at the end of the Beatitudes, it's talking about you, even when they persecute you and rile you and call names upon you for my name's sake, he said, leap for joy and rejoice because great is your reward in heaven. I don't know what that means, but if Jesus says it's great, then it's going to be great. So the point is this, there are rewards stored up for you in heaven. And how you steward your time, your talent, and your treasure is going to determine your payback. Luke 14, 14 talks about, and at the resurrection, the Lord will reward the just for ministering. And lastly, Hebrews 6 I gave this last week on a charge, and it says this, that without faith it is impossible to please God. For those that come to him must believe that he is. And knowing most all of you, you know who he is. He's our Savior. He's, he's everything that he says he is. But he's also a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. He's a God that loves to lavish on his children. And the point here is, without faith, faith is a key thing in our walk, brothers and sisters. Faith requires action. In fact, in the book of James, it talks about one guy was boasting about how much faith he had. And James said, hey, I've got faith plus works. So they're coupled together. All of these works that we're doing for the kingdom is being tallied up. Our master's keeping a record of it. Oh, and did you know that in Ephesians 2.10, it says, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. Every single one of us, that is our purpose, is to be created for good works. The master architect has designed, built, and fashioned you to work. Not only the gifts and talents that he's placed in our lives here, but the talents and gifts for eternity. You were created for that. And this, this word works is ergon, E-R-G-O-N. It means to accomplish. It means to work. It means a work or a worker who accomplishes something, a deed, an action, Things that are carried out to completion from an internal desire. Every single one of us 
is commissioned to do these works. I'm not here today to twist your arm on getting involved here at the church. I would love for Jason and Shelley to have a waiting list of people ready to volunteer to do things. I'm not here to tell you you need to give your money to the church. The scripture tells us that. What I'm here to bring to your focus today is how are you managing these things that are going to go on before you for eternity? I know I've talked to people about this and they're like, I'm just happy to make it to heaven. <laughs> but that's not the kingdom way. The Lord has so much more. We're not people that just barely squeak by. I mean, she talked about it in her charge. We're to be abundant, overflowing in good works. We're charged to actually conduct and operate in good works everywhere we go. That thing in Ephesians there, that word there, that that's what we're all designed and commissioned for. John 15, it's a wonderful chapter about the vine and the branches. And in that little story there, Jesus talks about four different works that happens in your life. You go from no works to works, and that's when you transition into the kingdom. And from works, you go to more works. And from more works, you end up in much or much fruit, as it says. Fruit and works are interchangeable in there. In fact, they're not the same Greek word, but the same, they're almost the same parallel on the meanings. But the, the thing in John there, it goes a little bit step further. It actually introduces words like harvest, crop, benefit. So these works that we're, we're doing on this worth and in this life are going to produce a harvest both here and now and in eternity. What I'm trying to do today is found in Hebrews 10:24. And it simply says this, I'm here to spur you on to love and to good works. And the second half of that verse goes on into verse 25, where it talks about we're not to forsake the assembling together, but when that day comes, we're going to have to do more here We're not to forsake the assembling together, but do more. What I want to say this in closing. That word spur there, it's kind of prickly. I don't like to be spurred. And I know if I was a horse, I certainly wouldn't want to be spurred. But that word has a, a, a really interesting meaning. It has a note here that says we're actually supposed to provoke one another to the point of upsetting them to carry on in love and good works. I don't want to make anybody mad, but I think the emphasis that the Lord's trying to get us to understand is things that we do here are going to produce such a harvest both in this life and the life to come that there's a hard and encouraging word here. It's like it also says it's a jab. It's, it's a poke. It's a prodding. Ouch. So if I bring a cattle prod in here next week, that's going to be my way to spur you on. I'll do it gently. No, I'm teasing. But I want to give you an, an, a closing analogy here. Let's just say, how many has ever been to a Super Bowl? Got one person, not too many. What if you had the opportunity to go to the, the Super Bowl? You're in there, coach 
let's, let's say the heavenly coach says, hey, I don't want you set up in the stands. I want you to come down here on the field. In fact, I've got so much confidence in you, I'm going to give you my playbook. Not only am I going to give you your playbook, but I want you to go out there and run some plays in the field. Now, in this playbook, it's got everything that you can need to do this. And trust me, I'm the coach of all coaches, and I know how this saying works. And not only am I the coach of all coaches, but I guarantee you that you're going to score some touchdowns. You see, the, the Christian life is not meant for us to sit up in the stands. It's meant to get out on the field and do our part in the kingdom. Now, I don't think there's a person in here that would, like, turn down that opportunity to do that, especially if there's guarantees associated with it. That's the way our Lord is, is telling us that there are so many guarantees and opportunities to be blessed in this life. That's what I want to leave you with today is I want you to see every opportunity that, that comes before you as an opportunity to make an investment both in the here and then. Every opportunity that rolls around, and I know we even pray for opportunities, but they're all over the place. And this is not a beat you over the head sermon or nothing like this. This is to encourage you that every time that you do these things, our Lord is watching and he's making a note in the books. And there are books that are going to be open that day. So I want to encourage you to think about these things, maybe while you're sitting idly at home sometime. Maybe if you're looking for something to do, ask the Lord, is there anything that I can do to make deposits in my heavenly account for you? I'm not asking you to get all stretched out doing works because you have to keep a balance in your life. It's very important. But I want to encourage you today that He's watching us. And I want to just, if anybody wants to come up to the altar today, maybe there's areas that you don't know where you want to get involved in. Every single one of you has deposits in your life from the Lord. When he rose up, he deposited gifts into mankind, it says in Ephesians. Every single one of you has things in you that can be used both for your heavenly work, your work here, and your earthly manners. That's one of the purposes that we give classes like Caneo, Kingdom Foundations, or even Higher Grounds. We try to find those things that you're good at and we pull them out of you to be used as an investment tool for the kingdom. In closing today, I just want to say, I want to stand up there with all of you all one day and hear the Lord say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And I'm sure you want that too. Just remember that our God is a loving Father. We're all in this together. We're all rowing in the same boat. We all have different gifts, talents, and treasures that can be presented and I want to encourage you to get involved somewhere. If you don't know where to get involved, come and see one of us. We'll help you. Shelly could use help in the daycare. There's things around the church here to do. You could set aside 10 minutes a week and pray for a city official or the president. Well, maybe more than 10 minutes for him. But, but there are multitudes of things that we can do to make those deposits in our heavenly account. So I just want to pray for you today. I want to thank you for the opportunity to sharing this with you. And I hope that I've painted a little bit of a picture of eternity for you, that the things that we do in this lifetime are going to go on forever. So why don't you stand up with me today?
Lord, I just want to thank you so much. You have invested so much into us. You've purchased us with your precious blood. You've bought and paid for us. We belong to you, God. And there are things in the kingdom and ways in the kingdom that you have us to ebb and flow. And I want to ask, Lord, that you just allow revelation, knowledge, and light to come to your people. Father, you're waiting to lavishly pour out on your people. But a lot of times, we hinder that process. And I want to ask, Lord God, that you open up opportunities for every single one here to be your light in this world, to be your light in the store and at the gas pumps and at their place of employment. Father, I just ask of you to pour back on them, both in this life and in the life to come, the blessings that you have for them. And Father, I just want to thank you that if those that are struggling with maybe what to do and how to get involved, where they need to go, that you would open up and give them a picture in their mind. Show them what their gifts and their talents are, Lord, to be used for your glory. And God, give them the boldness to step forward and to use those talents for your kingdom's sake. Every one of us are players on the field for the kingdom's sake. And Lord, I pray that every single one of them, whenever they cross over, that they will hear the words, Thou good and faithful servant, enter in to the joy of the Lord. We want to bless you. I want to thank you and praise you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. I thank you and bless you today. God bless you. Be safe out there. Amen.